All right, so let's get started. But um, before we begin with the presentation, uh, just a few quick uh, household or housekeeping items. So first, um, please be sure to mute your microphone and keep it muted during the entire webinar. Um, that way we can keep the uh, noise levels down to a minimum. Uh, second, uh, it would be great if you could turn um, on your video so that I can see uh, my audience. You don't have to, it's completely optional, but it would be great to be able to see all of your lovely faces. Um, third, uh, please type any questions that you have in the chat window. And then uh, my assistant, Gio, she's gonna gather all of the questions for the Q&A session. And finally, uh, we're gonna have a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. So please just be sure to hold all, well, you can type your questions at any point in time, but we will answer all of the questions at the end in order to minimize the disruption to the flow of the presentation. Okay, so there are probably a few people here who don't know who I am. So I figure I should probably introduce myself to let you know who I am, where I come from and why I'm interested in this topic. So my name is Matthew Renzi. I'm a data science consultant, author and public speaker. I'm also the president of Serenzi Global, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization devoted to providing free technology education to underrepresented individuals in the IT industry. In fact, we have several of our students here available or present today. Uh, I'm also the co-organizer of Antarctic Comp, the first ever technology conference in Antarctica. My focus is on artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and data science. I have over 20 years of professional experience building large-scale data-driven intelligent software systems. And I have double degrees in computer science and philosophy with a minor in economics. I also have a data science specialization from Johns Hopkins. In addition, I'm a Microsoft MVP and ASP Insider, and then an author for Pluralsight, Udemy, and Skillshare. And I contribute a lot to the open source software community. But that's enough about me. We're here to talk about AI today. So over the past few millennia, humanity has gone through several major technology revolutions. Around 10,000 years ago, we entered the agricultural revolution. This revolution led to new technologies like farming, the plow, and the wheel. As a result, agricultural societies spread from the cradle of civilization to the ends of the earth. Around 250 years ago, we entered the Industrial Revolution. This revolution led to new technologies like steam power, the factory, and electricity. As a result, industrial societies flourished and spread across the globe. Whoops, sorry, my slide stopped. And less than 100 years ago, we entered the Information Revolution. This revolution led to new technologies like telecommunications, electronic computers, and digital information. As a result, high-tech societies flourished and spread across the globe and throughout cyberspace. With each of these revolutions, human society was radically transformed over a relatively short period of time. With each revolution, we saw a wellspring of new technologies that had never existed before. And with each revolution, there were those who were prepared and thrived in this new world, and those who were unprepared and essentially became redundant, unemployable, or obsolete. Today, we're entering the next major revolution in human history, the artificial intelligence revolution. And like the previous technology revolutions, we will likely see a fundamental transformation of our economy and our society. We're also gonna see a wellspring of new AI-enabled technologies. And as a result, there will be some people who will prepare and thrive in this new world, and others who unfortunately will not be prepared and will likely become redundant, unemployable, or obsolete. The purpose of this presentation is to answer the following question. What should I do today to prepare my career for the coming wave of AI-enabled automation? What should you be doing right now to prepare as we enter the next major technology revolution? However, I don't want to give you a bunch of pie-in-the-sky wishful thinking. Um, I want to provide you with advice that's specific, actionable, pragmatic, and timely. Advice that you'll be able to put to good use today to ensure your success through the AI revolution and beyond. To answer this question, I'll provide you with the following five recommendations. Educate yourself about AI, upgrade your career for AI, invest in an AI-first economy, use AI responsibly and ethically, and adapt to what comes next or become obsolete. With each recommendation, we're gonna go a bit wider in scope and longer in our time scales. But first, before we get into the practical advice, um, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about what artificial intelligence is and what it isn't. So what is AI? Well, artificial intelligence is a field of computer science that attempts to create machines that act rationally in response to their environment. An AI is any machine that perceives its environment and chooses actions that maximize the likelihood of achieving a goal of some kind. Essentially, it's just a machine that takes data as input and produces some kind of output given what it currently knows. Some examples of AI include computers that can play chess, robots that can vacuum your floor, non-player characters in video games, and the navigation software on your smartphone. 
Any computer algorithm that replicates some aspect of human intelligence or natural intelligence is essentially a form of artificial intelligence. Now, when I say artificial intelligence, many of you will immediately think of sentient robots like R2-D2, data from Star Trek, or HAL 9000. Now, this is what we refer to as artificial general intelligence or general AI. It's a type of AI that's able to solve a wide variety of general purpose problems. It's a futuristic AI. It doesn't currently exist today. In fact, it's likely going to be several decades before we reach this level of highly flexible and adaptable AI. However, this is the direction that things are moving and the eventual goal of many uh, AI research projects. On the other hand, many of you may think of modern AI like IBM's Watson, Amazon Alexa, or Google self-driving car. And now this is what we call artificial narrow intelligence or narrow AI. Narrow AI is focused on solving a very narrow set of specific problems. It's the type of AI that exists today. It's the type of AI we're gonna be talking about during this presentation. And it's also the type of AI that's likely gonna revolutionize our world over the next few decades. Now, it might surprise some of you that AI has been around for quite some time. In fact, the field of artificial intelligence dates all the way back to the 1950s. In the past, we had some machines that were capable of making rational decisions. However, they had to be explicitly programmed to make these decisions, and they could only operate successfully in very constrained environments. There was a lot of hype about what artificial intelligence would eventually be able to do. Many experts predicted machines would soon replace all human labor, but it never happened. And by the end of the 90s, machines couldn't even solve basic general purpose tasks that even a toddler could solve. The inflated hype about the potential of AI and subsequent disillusionment when none of this stuff ever came true ended up leading to what we now refer to as the AI winters. Multiple periods between the late 70s into the early 2000s where funding for AI had almost entirely dried up. However, by the mid 2000s, the last AI winter has ended and things are starting to warm up again. Today in 2020, AI is booming because of recent advances in machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning. These advances are largely the result of four changes that have occurred over just the past few decades. We now have a tremendous amount of data available for training these models. We now have significantly more compute power available. We have better algorithms for training AI models, and we have much more disciplined approach to uh, AI now. It's a data science approach that we're using. And if these trends continue, in the very near future, AI will likely become even more lucrative as it begins to disrupt almost every industry imaginable. So to quickly recap, what is AI? An AI is a machine that can act rationally in, res in response to its environment. Uh, we're talking specifically about narrow AI, which can only solve a very limited set of problems. And it's an industry that's been through various cycles of booms and busts, largely based upon the ratio of hype versus real world applications. So now I hope we're all on the same page about what AI is and what it isn't, so we can move on to the advice and recommendations. So step number one or tip number one is to educate yourself about AI. So why is education important during a technology revolution? Why can't we just continue going about our day-to-day -day lives as the world changes around us? With each of the previous technology revolutions, there was a need to update human education to function in the new world. With the agricultural revolution, humans had to become proficient with agricultural technologies. As a result, we had to learn how to farm, domesticate animals, and use a plow. With the industrial revolution, humans had to become proficient with industrial uh, technologies. As a result, we had to learn how to operate steam engines, run machinery, and use electricity. And with the information revolution, humans had to become proficient with information technologies. As a result, we had to learn how to use telephones, work with computers, and program software. With the AI revolution, humanity once again will need to update its basic skill set to become AI literate. Uh, we need to learn how to train AI models, develop AI applications, and use AI tools. Whether you realize it or not, our world is going through a major transition as we speak. We're essentially entering the era of artificial intelligence and machine learning, a future where machines will be doing many of the jobs that humans are currently doing today. As a result, the software industry is preparing to go through a major workforce transition as well. In the past, we would have to explicitly program a computer step-by-step -step to solve a problem. This involved a lot of if-then statements, for loops, and logical operations. In the future, or today, however, machines can teach themselves how to solve problems on their own. We just need to provide the data. 
And now this is a radically different way of working with the computer than we're used to as software developers and IT professionals. While there's a growing demand for individuals with the skills necessary to implement AI solutions, there's currently a shortage of people capable of teaching machines how to solve problems in this new way. As a result, those with the skills necessary to leverage AI are commanding significantly higher salaries, and this trend doesn't seem to have any end in sight. Think back to the last major technology revolution, the information revolution. Each of us had a choice to either learn how to use a computer or to stay computer illiterate. And now think of all the opportunities that computer literacy has afforded you over the years, and think of all the disadvantages for those that can barely use a computer. The same will be true of AI literacy during the AI revolution. Those who are AI literate will be highly functional in our new economy, and those who are not will essentially sit on the sidelines and eventually become obsolete. So how do you educate yourself about AI? What should you be doing today to teach yourself about this new set of AI technologies? Now, unfortunately, there's no one size fits all answer. However, I have some general recommendations to get you pointed in the right direction. First, learn the basics of AI. Having core AI literacy will be important no matter who you are or what you do with AI. You need to learn the difference between what's real versus what is hype. Um, what, what can AI do successfully today versus what things are currently impossible or impractical? Learn about data science, machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning. Learn what they are, how they work, and why they're important for AI. Learn the difference between the various types of AI, like symbolic AI versus expert systems versus data-driven AI. Everyone in the general public will need to have at least a basic level of AI literacy in order to function in an AI-driven society. You won't need to be an expert, but you'll have to have a basic understanding of these concepts. Second, choose your objective with AI. What do you actually want to do with artificial intelligence? Do you want to automate decisions, predictions, or manual tasks with AI? If so, you'll need to learn how to train new AI models using machine learning algorithms. Do you want to solve new problems with AI software? If so, you'll need to learn how to develop AI applications using pre-trained AI models created by third parties. Or do you just want to be more productive uh, with your own day-to-day -day tasks using AI? Well, if so, you'll need to learn how to use pre-built AI tools that are created by third-party AI solution providers. Third, get the right training. So for each of the three objectives that we just discussed, there's an ideal curriculum or learning path. So if you want to train new AI models, um, you're gonna need training in both data science and machine learning. If you just wanna develop new AI applications but not train models on your own, uh, you'll need programming skills and the ability to use these pre-trained AI models that someone else has created. Or if you just wanna use AI tools as an end user, then you just need basic AI literacy in training on each of these specific AI tools as necessary. What's important is that you get the right training based upon your chosen objective. Make sure you're going down the right learning path based on what you want to end up doing with artificial intelligence in the end. Fourth, you need to practice your skills. So no matter which of those three paths you choose, you're gonna need lots of practice. You know, it's, it's one thing to know what a neural network is, but it's an entirely different thing to be able to train a deep neural network to detect fraud. So you can participate in online competitions like Kaggle competitions to apply your skills while you're learning from your peers. Or you can create and maintain an open source project to share your knowledge, the things that you're learning with others while you're learning them. Or find low risk projects at work uh, to practice your new skills and build your portfolio. Ultimately, find lots of opportunities to practice these skills that you're learning. Finally, choose reliable sources of information. So unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there using big hype and a bunch of buzzwords to try taking advantage of you so that they can take your money. So you want to avoid the AI hucksters, charlatans, and snake oil salesmen out there. Instead, you need to find trusted sources for all of your information and training. So be sure to check your source's credentials, qualifications, and experience. You wanna make sure that you're getting the most value from your investment in your AI education. So to recap our first recommendation, educate yourself about AI. Learn the basics of AI, choose your objective with AI, get the right training, practice your skills, and choose reliable sources. And I'll provide you with a list of uh, references, places you can go next to learn more of these in-depth skills here at the end of the presentation. All right, step two, upgrade your career for AI. Will AI take my job? Now, this is probably the most common question I get asked when I tell people that I work with artificial intelligence. The answer, no surprise, is it depends. 
So during each of the previous technology revolutions, we've seen fundamental shifts in employment. During the agricultural revolution, we saw the rise of the farmer and the decline of the hunter-gatherer. During the industrial revolution, we saw the rise of the factory worker and the decline of the artisan and craftsman. And during the information revolution, we saw the rise of the knowledge worker and a decline of the manual laborer. During the AI revolution, we're likely gonna see a similar shift in careers within our labor economy. Now, imagine you could ask a horse in the early 1900s how the automobile or tractor would have changed its life. It probably would have told you that, you know, a car, a tractor is gonna make my life a lot easier. I'm not gonna have to haul all this stuff anymore and I can just go about my day in recreation. Well, unfortunately for the horse, these technologies also made them obsolete to the economy. In fact, we hit peak horse in 1915. That's the year that the automobile and tractor began to scale up in production, and we've seen a decline in horse population ever since. Today, the emergence of modern AI is beginning to have a strong impact on our labor economy. In the near future, this impact on labor is likely going to be tremendous. AI will automate a significant number of jobs in just the next few decades. Given the economics driving this trend, it's, it's less a matter of if a given job is gonna re be replaced and more a matter of when. In fact, some experts are attempting to predict which jobs are most likely to be automated based on measures like their repetitiveness and complexity. Based on these measures, we can see which type of AI technology will be necessary to automate a variety of occupational tasks. For example, we can see which retail jobs will likely be automated in the coming years as AI continues to be applied to retail sales. Even the medical industry isn't immune to this coming wave of automation. While these medical tasks are generally more complex and less repetitive than most jobs, they're rapidly becoming within the reach of modern AI. We can then extrapolate this information to determine which sectors of our economy will be hit the hardest by AI automation. The length of the bars in this chart represent the total number of workers in each type of employment in the United States as of 2016. The red bar segments represent the proportion of jobs that are at risk of automation within the next two decades. The blue bar segments represent the proportion of jobs that are not at risk of automation in the next two decades. As we can see, if these predictions are correct, the future landscape of labor in just the next few decades is gonna look radically different than it currently does today. In fact, we can even use these data to predict which cities will be most impacted by unemployment from AI automation. And unfortunately, I only have this data available for the US. Um, but as you can see, that little orange dot right there on the map uh, is Las Vegas, Nevada. That's where I currently live. And that's actually number one on the list right now. In fact, 65% of all jobs in Las Vegas are at risk of automation by 2035. And half of all jobs in the United States are at risk of automation in the next two decades. You can see why I think this is such a big deal and why we need to be moving as quickly as we can to help retrain people uh, in these new high-tech jobs. Now, there's certainly going to be jobs that are more resistant to automation. Uh, these jobs require more human aspects like compassion, creativity, empathy, and trust. However, there are many jobs today that are unlikely to exist in the next few decades or are going to look completely different as certain tasks within those jobs will be automated. And this is going to create a tremendous disruption to our labor economy with unemployment, uh, retraining for new jobs, and early retirement. On the other hand, it will likely create tremendous opportunities for new jobs that don't yet exist and for the IT professionals that build these automation systems. According to McKinsey Global Institute, AI is currently expected to automate approximately 600 million jobs. That's roughly 22% of all jobs that exist in our world today, gone in just 10 years. Fortunately, they're also predicting 700 million new jobs will be created by 2030, many of which will be jobs that require AI tech skills. And ultimately, this is going to have a tremendous disruption uh, on our labor economy in just less than a decade's period of time from all of the data that I'm currently seeing. The big question right now is whether AI will create more jobs than it eliminates. In the short term, it looks like we're going to create more jobs than we'll eliminate. But historically, and, and historically technology revolutions have uh, in the past created more new job opportunities than they've destroyed. With every revolution we've had, we've seen a growth in the labor economy. Uh, however, there's pretty compelling evidence to suggest that this AI revolution might be different because of the types of jobs that are being automated and the potential new jobs that could be created as a result. So we're beginning to transition from an economy where most of the work of value is done by humans to one where most of the work of value is essentially going to be done by machines. And as a result, it's really important that you ask yourself, which side of this new economy will your job be on? 
the side that's leading the new economy or the side that's being eliminated. So how should you upgrade your career for AI? What should you be doing today to prepare your career for AI-enabled automation? First, determine if your job is at risk. If your job is simple, repetitive, dangerous, error-prone, or expensive, uh, then it is, a, it is at a higher risk of being automated. Or if your job is uh, complex, creative, strategic, compassionate, or uniquely human, then it's at a lower risk of being automated. However, it's really important to note that most jobs will not be completely eliminated by AI. Rather, you're gonna, they're going to be partially automated as many of the day-to-day -day tasks that you do within that job uh, become automatable with AI. And as a result, you will essentially spend most of your time essentially uh, working with AI tools to do the work for you or possibly babysitting robots that are doing the work for you. Second, decide if your company is at risk of becoming obsolete within an AI-first economy. Uh, are you still using traditional business tools while your competitors are automating with AI? Um, are you still relying on guesswork while others are using data to improve decision making? Or are you in an industry that's currently being disrupted by a new AI enabled business model? If so, you need to begin helping your company embrace AI now and get them moving in the right direction. Because unfortunately, it's quite likely that there are a lot of employers are, that are resistant to change are not going to survive this transition into the new AI economy. Same thing we saw with the previous revolutions. Those who are not willing to adapt to the changing conditions of the economy um, and the market forces uh, did not survive. Third, you need to choose an AI career path. Um, if you want to get involved with AI, you need to decide how closely and how deeply you want to work with artificial intelligence. Do you want to train AI models? Um, if so, you're going to need to find a company that has access to lots of data and compute power to use for these uh, for training. We're talking companies like Google, Microsoft, people with a lot of uh, data and a lot of resources in order to train models. And not just the Googles and the Microsofts, um, other Fortune 500 companies or people that have access to these data sets and computational resources. If you want to develop AI applications, you're going to need to work for a tech company that has access to pre-trained AI models from third-party service providers. So your company could use models from like Microsoft or Google or someone else that's providing the, the AI models, and then you can embed those into your software applications yourself. Or if you just want to use AI tools, uh, which almost everyone's going to have to at some point in time if you're in the knowledge workspace, uh, you can essentially work for anyone, provided that they encourage the use of these new AI tools. If they're resistant to using these tools, that should be a red flag that, that maybe uh, they need to evolve or maybe you need to move on to a new organization. Ultimately, you need to decide what you want to do with AI before you can decide on a career path. Fourth, get into the AI value stream. So you don't need to be working at Google or Microsoft to make a good living in the new AI economy. However, you do want to be part of the AI value stream or the ecosystem that's built on top of AI technologies. And now this can involve transitioning your career into horizontal markets that are positioned within the AI value stream. For example, jobs working on the Internet of Things, uh, big data, virtual and augmented reality, robotics and drones, things that are heavily dependent upon AI technologies or are moving the ball forward with AI. Or this can involve transitioning your career into a vertical industry that's built on top of AI technologies. Essentially, looks, look for jobs in industries that generate lots of data um, to train AI models uh, or use those AI models to improve their existing products or services. Finally, focus on the uniquely human aspects of your job. So avoid specializing too deeply in tasks that can be easily automated. These include tasks that are simple, repetitious, error-prone, or dangerous. Instead, specialize on the aspects of your job that cannot be easily automated. These include aspects like human interaction, creativity, compassion, and establishing trust. These are the tasks that are going to remain when all of the mundane tasks and repetitious tasks have been automated away with AI. So to recap our second recommendation, upgrade your career for AI. Determine if your job is at risk of automation. Decide if your company is at risk of becoming obsolete. Choose an AI career path get into the AI value stream, and focus on the human aspects of your job. Step three, invest in an AI-first economy. So who will be the world's first trillionaire? Who's going to win and who's going to lose in this new AI economy? 
So during the agricultural revolution, we had visionary societies like the Sumerians, the Egyptians, and the Chinese. They all capitalized on key technologies of the agricultural revolution. As a result, they became some of the largest and most powerful civilizations on earth at the time. During the industrial revolution, we had visionaries like John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, and Henry Ford. They all capitalized on the key technologies of the industrial era. As a result, they became some of the wealthiest and most influential people on the planet. During the information revolution, we had visionary companies like IBM, Microsoft, and Google. And they all capitalized on the key technologies of the information age. As a result, they became some of the most influential and wealthiest uh, corporations on the planet. During the AI revolution, we're likely going to have future visionaries, and they are also going to capitalize on these key AI technologies. As a result, they will likely become some of the wealthiest and most powerful people, businesses, and governments on the planet. In fact, many experts predict that the world's first trillionaire will likely be created as a result of uh, AI automation technology, either AI predicting prices in the stock market or AI automating labor in a new space that no one's ever thought of. And currently, if you look at the, uh, the world's richest people, uh, almost all of them are involved in AI. So according to the McKinsey Global Institute, AI is expected to generate $13 trillion in real economic value by 2030. That's a 16% increase in our current global GDP in just under 10 years. This is a huge amount of wealth that's going to be generated in a very short period of time. We've never seen anything like this in the past. The AI revolution will likely have a significant impact on our economy and capitalism as we know it. And these changes will require that individuals, businesses, and governments need to adapt in order to function in this new AI-first economy. First, we're seeing a shift in returns to capital versus returns to labor. So returns to capital are essentially how much money can you make by investing in capital assets? These include investing in machines, software, data, and more. Returns to labor are essentially how much money can you make by soliciting your labor for income. This includes physical labor, knowledge work, and even highly specialized labor. Over the past few decades, we've seen a continuous upward trend in returns to capital. As a result, the value that you can get from investing in capital assets continues to increase. On the other hand, we've seen a continuous decrease in returns to labor. As a result, the value that you can get from each hour of your labor is continuing to decrease on average. Essentially, labor is becoming cheaper and automation is becoming progressively more profitable. This phenomenon is referred to as the great decoupling. Essentially, productivity in the USA continues to rise year after year. However, somewhere in the 1970s, the labor compensation broke away from the productivity gain trend. And this diverging trend uh, looks like it's going to continue into the future and likely will become even further amplified with increasing AI automation. Second, data may likely become one of the most valuable resources in our information economy. Those who have the most data and the ability to enable AI with that data are going to wield tremendous power in our information economy. In fact, there are data sets today that are worth over a billion dollars. That's just ones and zeros sitting on a hard drive in a computer somewhere that are worth over a billion dollars because of what that data can predict or what it can do. Third, the AI revolution looks like it's leading to a significantly more nonlinear economy. Those with smart machines are going to have even more power than those uh, when those without these smart machines are unfortunately looking like they're going to have even less power. As a result, it's going to become progressively harder for individuals and small businesses to compete with large established tech companies unless we do something in order to change this power dynamic, which I'm really hoping we start doing uh, both in terms of politics and in terms of uh, people being informed about this inform or about this stuff. Um, unless we do something to change this uh, state of affairs, this is going to continue to get worse. So I'm really hoping we start doing things to change this uh, trajectory in the very near future. So how should you invest in an AI-first economy? What should you be doing today to capitalize on AI automation? First, before you make any other investments, be sure to invest in yourself. The best way to leverage your time, money, and resources is to invest in your education and your career first. And we've covered, essentially, we spent the first half of this presentation uh, covering these two recommendations. However, it is important enough that I feel it needs to be stated again. The best investment you can make right now is an investment in yourself. Second, invest in AI solutions to solve real world problems. No matter who you are, there are AI solutions available today or soon will be that can solve a wide variety of problems that you face on a daily basis at your job and in your own personal life. 
If you're a manager of a company or a business owner, uh, you can use AI to improve business operations. Invest in AI to make better decisions, to build smarter products, or to automate manual labor. If you're an employee or a contractor, you can use AI to increase your own personal productivity. Invest in off-the-shelf productivity-enhancing tools that will automate the parts of your job that are monotonous, repetitious, or inefficient, so you can focus on the things that you're uniquely qualified as a human uh, to do. And outside of work, um, we can use AI solutions uh, to make our lives more enjoyable. There are many AI products and services available today, and more that are coming, uh, that will simplify our life and eliminate chores that we don't enjoy doing. However, you need to let economics drive these AI solutions. The benefit you receive from an AI solution must be greater than the cost to automate and maintain that solution. Otherwise, it's not a worthwhile investment in terms of return on investment or ROI. Third, don't depend solely on your labor for income. For most people, labor makes the majority of all of our income. However, it's going to become less valuable or progressively less valuable as we automate more jobs. Uh, this includes manual labor, knowledge work, and even some highly specialized labor. But the more specialized you can get in terms of your labor, the more high tech you can get, the better off you're going to be in terms of uh, your hourly uh, rate. Instead, you want to begin to start putting your money into wealth generating assets. These include investing in companies, uh, selling your own products if you want to start your own business, uh, or providing automated services, once again, if you start your own business. Your labor can only make you money while you're working. However, assets allow you to make money 24 hours a day, even when you're asleep. Third, invest in the economy as a whole. The AI revolution is ultimately going to lift the entire economy. So you don't need to try to outsmart the markets. Um, you just need to invest in the economy as a whole. So I'm going to tell you my personal investment strategy. Now, keep in mind, I am not a financial advisor, so I'm not giving any official financial advice. I'm just telling you what I do and uh, essentially why it works. So first, I diversify my investments to reduce my overall risk. I do this by investing in index funds with very low expense ratios, uh, like Vanguard's total stock uh, index fund and their world stock index fund. So index funds essentially spread your investments across the entire stock market to minimize your risk. Essentially, the entire global economy would have to fail miserably in order for me to lose all of my, uh, all of my wealth. Uh, I buy low and then I hold all of my investments. I don't day trade, I don't speculate, I don't short sell or try timing the market. Instead, I just invest regularly in my index funds. I put extra money in when the market's low and I keep all of my investments long-term uh, in order to, uh, well, and then essentially I just rebalance them once a year. So I, I don't look at stock news every day or anything like that. And I have a safety net uh, during economic downturns. I have just enough in the bond market and semi-liquid assets to cover me during a recession. Uh, and I progressively grow the size of the safety net as I get closer to retirement when I would likely need this uh, safety net the most. Um, I'm just following a ridiculously simple yet highly effective investment strategy. Um, I've got it well documented on my website. So if you're interested in learning more, just check out the article that I wrote, I think a month or two ago. Fifth, um, invest early for compound growth. So exponential curves like the growth of GDP per capita in the USA, uh, which is essentially our measure of economic output per person, they, these uh, charts start out slow and then they explode quite rapidly. So the sooner you can invest in the AI economy, the, sooner, the better off you're going to be exponentially in the long run. You know, essentially the next Googles, Amazons, and Microsofts, they are out there now or soon will be. And you don't need to find them yourself if you're investing in the economy as a whole. You just need to invest now so that your investments are going to reap the uh, reward of long-term exponential growth. So to recap our third recommendation, invest in an AI-first economy. Invest in yourself first. Invest in AI solutions to real-world problems. Don't depend solely on your labor for income. Invest in the economy as a whole. And invest early for compound growth. Step four, use AI responsibly and ethically. With great power comes great responsibility. During the previous technology revolutions, humans gained access to new superpowers. And in many cases, these new superpowers were abused, often to the detriment of many less fortunate individuals. Agricultural societies gained the ability to raise large armies, and they often misused these powers to acquire new land, enslave human labor, and subjugate entire civilizations. Industrial societies gain the ability to wage mechanized warfare, and they misuse this superpower to control resources, maintain colonies, and expand their political influence. 
Information societies gain the ability to wage cyber warfare, and we've definitely misused this new superpower with mass surveillance, industrial sabotage, and political propaganda. With the AI revolution, this is likely going to be more of the same. We're going to discover some amazing new superpowers in just the next few years. However, there are going to be some people who are going to try to use these new superpowers for their own self-interest and personal agendas. With technology revolutions, we're like children getting our hands on a sharp object for the first time. Uh, we typically don't learn our lessons until we've cut ourselves once or twice. And if you need a, a real world example, literally the World War I and World War II were the results of mechanized warfare or mechanization being applied to warfare. It didn't turn out well at all. The difference with AI though, is that we might not get a second chance to learn from our mistakes. With great power comes great responsibility. And with AI, we have the greatest responsibility that humankind has ever known. The emergence of modern AI has led to some rather interesting ethical issues in just the recent years. For example, we now have facial recognition systems throughout our cities that may be violating our rights to privacy. Uh, we have AI generated advertisements that are using a consumer's behavioral profile to psychologically manipulate their purchase decisions. We have text generation software like GPT-3 that can generate propaganda and fake news on a massive scale. And we've, we've seen how this uh, has panned out in recent years. Uh, we have uh, deep fake technology that, has been, or that can be used to impersonate politicians, celebrities, and executives for nefarious purposes. And we've seen this happen too. Uh, uh, CEOs' voices have been impersonated by AI robots in order to do funds transfers between bank accounts. And we have deep nude technology that can digitally remove a person's clothing without their consent and has been used for blackmail and ex exploitation. And we also have semi-autonomous weapons that are very close to becoming fully autonomous weapons. These are just a few of the current ethical issues that we're now facing with modern AI. And there's much more advanced and sophisticated AI technologies just over the horizon. Given this, the number and severity of these ethical issues is likely to, likely to increase significantly in the near future. To put it simply, we're gonna have some very difficult ethical issues to deal with in our lifetimes. For example, what does privacy mean in a world with constant and pervasive AI surveillance? We currently have very little privacy now and we're about to get a lot less. How do we avoid bias and discrimination in our AI models? It's easy to create biased AI models that will directly impact the lives of millions of people. And even more concerning, should we allow AI to be weaponized? Should we ban fully autonomous weapons now before we enter a new AI arms race? And if we do, how long until a conflict between two countries pressures a government to override this directive? How should we allocate resources in a post-human labor world? Some economists suggest that we need either a guaranteed basic income, a negative income tax, a social stipend, or some kind of universal basic ownership. But how do we pay for that? Should we tax robots in order to offset the inevitable unemployment from automation? How do we even begin to determine the true value of each robot's labor in order to tax their labor appropriately? And if we tax robots, what rights should they have in our society? I mean, we fought wars over the idea of no taxation without representation. So what will the machines, or more likely, the capitalists that own them, demand in return for paying the bulk of all taxes in the world? We have a lot of ethical questions that we need to answer in the coming decades. The most important of these ethical questions, though, is what does this mean for humanity? What is our purpose in a world where machines do all of the work of real economic value? Does this technology set us free, or does humanity eventually become obsolete? So how do you use AI responsibly and ethically? What should you be doing now to ensure that you don't misuse our new AI superpowers? First, start asking the difficult questions now. If you haven't spent any time thinking about the ethical questions I just posed, then you're probably not prepared for what's rapidly approaching. You don't need to spend all day philosophizing about the legal, ethical, and political implications of AI. We're going to leave that up to the lawyers, philosophers, and politicians. However, you do need to be thinking about what your core values are and whether they agree or conflict with these new AI-created dilemmas. Each of us needs to know where we stand on these key issues before, we, before they start taking us by surprise. Second, avoid bias in your AI models. It's very easy to accidentally or intentionally create bias in your AI models. If you train a model with biased data, you will get biased results. As the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. And this creates feedback loops that can accidentally reinforce existing socioeconomic divisions with our society. And this is going to be especially true as these algorithms begin to impact the lives of millions of people. 
Third, provide transparency in your AI models. If you automate a decision with AI, you should make that decision-making process as transparent as possible. If AI becomes this magic black box that cannot be questioned, then how can anyone gain any recourse or get any recourse when it makes an incorrect decision? As a result, I recommend that you always use the simplest AI tool that effectively solves a given problem. Don't use a complex deep neural network if a much simpler decision tree classifier will suffice. And when possible, use explainable AI tools. Explainable AI provides diagnostic explanations for how and why a specific decision was made. Ultimately, ask yourself, could you explain to a judge how your model made the decision that it did? If you can't explain it to the judge or the judge wouldn't understand your answer, then it is not transparent. Fourth, protect your private data from abuse. Now, <laughs> if people knew what I could do uh, with uh, per their personal data and the right algorithm, they'd probably be a lot more cautious. However, uh, the general public is currently several steps behind data scientists in this domain. Most people don't know what we can do as with data science and, and the right private data. It's actually pretty scary stuff. So think about what data you're willing to make public and protect everything that you want to remain private. Only entrust your private data to organizations that you trust can and will protect your data. And if you are entrusted to protect the private data, data of others, be sure that you can and will protect their data. Finally, demand more from our leaders. Um, we have some serious AI-related ethical, legal, and social issues that we need to address, uh, not just in the, the near future, like they need to be addressed now. Unfortunately, most of our politicians have very little understanding of AI and thus are unable to make effective public policy decisions. So you need to choose representatives that understand AI and how it can be a benefit or a detriment to our future society. These decisions that they're going to be making in the next few years are going to have critical implications for the next many decades of uh, our, our governments and our, our local uh, political organizations. In addition, we need to choose the best corporations to lead our society in the right direction. Now, you vote for these corporations every time you spend money on their products and services. So vote for them with your dollars and then hold them accountable with your dollars if and when they fail us. To recap our fourth recommendation, use AI responsibly and ethically. Start asking the difficult questions now, avoid bias in your AI models, provide transparency in your AI decisions, protect your private data from abuse, and demand more from our leaders. Fifth, oh, hold on. All right, so for our final recommendation, adapt to what comes next or become obsolete. Now, in this final recommendation, uh, we're gonna look at the very big picture. Um, our time frame is gonna extend out, you know, not just in the next decade or two, but we're gonna look out to the end of our lives and beyond. And we're also gonna get quite a bit more philosophical as well because of the nature of this, uh, this topic. So what becomes obsolete versus what becomes the norm? Why do some aspects of society disappear into obscurity while others become so common that we just start taking them for granted? So during the previous technology revolutions, some things became obsolete while other things became the norm. During the agricultural revolution, hunter-gatherers and nomadic tribes essentially became obsolete while farming in cities became the norm. During the Industrial Revolution, slave labor and draft animals became obsolete, while factory workers and industrial machines became the norm. And during the Information Revolution, human computers and analog data became obsolete, while office workers and digital computers became the norm. During the AI Revolution, the question naturally becomes, which parts of our world will become obsolete and what new things will become the norm? No matter how things play out over the next few decades, in the long run, there are really only three likely paths forward for humanity. So AI and humanity peacefully coexist together forever. Uh, AI destroys humanity if we don't accidentally destroy ourselves first. Or AI and humanity eventually merge and become one and the same thing. Um, if you really think about it, there aren't really any, th any other possibilities in the long run. One of these three things has to happen. I'm unaware of any other, any other path that this could take. So given human society's track record in similar situations, I think it's quite unlikely that humans will eventually or will be able to peacefully coexist with AI forever. We've simply seen too many past scenarios where a sufficiently advanced civilization or a civilization with a sufficiently advanced technology uh, has displaced the indigenous population. Um, it's actually much more likely that we'll either destroy ourselves first or AI will eventually displace humanity. And now that might be good for AI, but that is definitely bad news for us humans. So given these three options, the most realistic and hopeful path forward for humanity is that we eventually merge with our technology. 
Essentially, we merge to the extent that human intelligence and artificial intelligence are essentially indistinguishable from one another. They're essentially one in the same thing. There's not us versus them. There's just us. Now, this idea may seem quite far-fetched now, but these cell phones in our hands are already an extension of our brain. And the younger generation is ready and willing to have them connected directly to their minds if and when the technology becomes available. In many ways, we're already augmenting our human bodies and minds with man-made technologies on a daily basis. For example, we have wearable devices, uh, artificial limbs, pacemakers, contact lenses, conchular implants, and much more. In the next decade and beyond, it's likely that we'll be even more deeply and continuously connected with our technology. For example, coming soon are lightweight augmented reality glasses, implantable IoT devices, low-cost gene editing, and eventually brain-computer interfaces. Now, this may sound very strange, but we are likely one of the last generations of Homo sapiens to inhabit the Earth. Whatever comes next is likely going to be very different than what we've known for the past 200,000 years. So how should we adapt to what comes next to avoid becoming obsolete? What should you be doing today to prepare for whatever comes next? First, embrace change. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus famously said, change is the only constant in life. Well, technically, he actually said panta re, which translates from Greek to everything flows, but I think you get the point. If you fight change, you will continuously struggle your entire life. Not only will you struggle, but you will inevitably lose this battle every time. Change is a very powerful force. So it's better that you embrace change so that you can adapt to whatever comes next. Adaptability is highly valuable from an evolutionary perspective. And this is why uh, adaptability is a key pillar of the Agile Manifesto, many political and religious worldviews. Second, be skeptical, but not too skeptical. In the post-truth era, it's really easy to get duped into believing in correct information. We've seen a lot of this in recent years. It's really hard to know what's real and what's fake with all of the misinformation that's spread via news and social media. Skepticism is the natural antidote to this epistemological disease of modern society. In addition, you need to be skeptical of your own beliefs as well. Always question and continuously update your beliefs based on new evidence as it becomes available. As a data scientist, I am trained to do that, and I do it all the time. Third, keep an open mind. One of the worst things we can do today is to get ourselves stuck in our own dogmatic worldviews and not listen to any outside information. The information bubbles that we create in our society produce these echo chambers that reinforce our own confirmation bias and make us believe things uh, that may not be true or were true once and are no longer true today. So it's important that you constantly con are confronted with alternative perspectives that challenge your own beliefs. Also, you need to keep an open mind when new information disagrees with your current beliefs. Um, it's quite likely that a good portion of your belief system may become obsolete yet within your lifetime. And if you don't understand what I mean, just ask your grandparents how much the world has changed since they were children. It's a radically different place than they grew up in, and the rate of change in our world is accelerating at an exponential pace. It's The next 10 years are going to look like 20 years uh, of change in just a very short period of time. Fourth, pick your battles wisely. Now, there are some things that you need to stick to your guns on, but other things that you should be more flexible about. So figure out what your core beliefs are and fight for those beliefs when necessary. However, be flexible and open-minded about everything else. Ultimately, when picking your battles, just make sure that you don't accidentally end up on the wrong side of history. Finally, be mindful. Our brains evolved to survive in a very different environment than our modern technology-driven society. As a result, much of our suffering today is caused by this conflict between our human nature and our technology. Mindfulness is how we minimize this suffering and learn to coexist peacefully with our technology. And I'll be completely honest, making the commitment to practice mindfulness daily is probably the smartest thing I've done in my adult life. I highly recommend it to everyone. So to recap our final recommendation, adapt to what comes next or become obsolete. Embrace change, be skeptical, but keep an open mind, Pick your battles wisely and be mindful. All right, so let's wrap things up and learn where to go for more information so that you can take your next steps on your AI journey. First, if you liked this webinar, I have a version of it available as a free online course. Uh, it contains everything we covered today plus more, and it provides uh, additional learning resources, a quick reference guide, practice quizzes to make sure you've learned everything, practice exercises, and it helps you to develop an action plan uh, essentially to help you prepare your career for AI. 
Second, I have several other online courses uh, that cover the basics of artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning. And I'm assuming most of you uh, have a plural site subscription based upon the list of people I'm seeing in the participants window. Um, but if you do not have uh, access to plural site and you'd like a free 30-day um, trial, uh, just shoot me an email at my uh, public email address and I will uh, send out that 30-day access token to you right away. Third, be sure to check out my website. I have tons of free articles, videos, and courses on all of the topics we discussed and more. Um, I also offer on-site training and consulting services for businesses that are interested in getting started with data science, AI, or machine learning. And fourth, I encourage you to engage with me and this AI learning community. So please be sure to, well, we don't have any way to rate the presentation today. Normally I have a, a little form that you can rate the presentation. Uh, be sure to ask questions during the Q&A session. Um, send me comments via social media. And please provide me with your feedback. Um, it, it helps me to improve each and every one of these presentations that I do. And to recap my five recommendations to prepare your career for AI, uh, educate yourself about AI, upgrade your career for AI, invest in an AI first economy, use AI responsibly and ethically, and adapt to what comes next or become obsolete. Finally, how does this story end? How does our story end? Technology is inherently amoral. It is neither intrinsically good nor evil. The same technology can be used to take mankind to the moon, or it can be used to propel warheads into cities. As a result, it's gonna be up to us as a society to choose whether we want to use AI to make the world a better place for everyone, or to use it for our own power, profit, and control. The choice is ours to make. What will you choose? All right, so let's open it up to questions and answers. I'm gonna have my assistant, Geo. Uh, she's my business manager. Uh, she's going to read out the questions to me and I will answer them. So uh, if you have any questions, just be sure to type them in the chat window and she'll read them off and we'll get them answered right away. Okay. All right, uh, Anna Duncan asks us, how much time we got to learning this AI? Are we at the beginning of the AI revolution, correct? Yeah, so revolutions, like technology revolutions, are really difficult to say when they started and when they ended until after you're already through them. So most people would say like the industrial revolution began with the steam engine. But when, when the steam engine first came out, no one was like, oh, we're in the middle of the industrial revolution. And, you know, the technology revolution um, started, or the information revolution started with the first digital computer. But once again, I, I don't think people, most people realize they're in the middle of a revolution. So Right now, um, it's hard to say you know, whether it's actually begun or not. I would say the rate of change that's happening in this industry is fast enough that it has already begun. And if I had to take a guess as to when it started, it was probably when uh, like Google started to use um, applied machine learning uh, to, to solve the problem of search engines. And it's essentially been continuing ever since then. Uh, it's, it's, unless you're a, a, a historian of artificial intelligence, it's hard to see these patterns. But the pattern that we continuously saw is that, you know, we had uh, cycles of hype and then all of a sudden nothing panned out and then it went into, a, you know, a AI winter. And then we saw another cycle of hype with a new technology and back into an AI winter. The difference this time, though, is that um, once companies like Google bought into this idea of, OK, we can use like a statistical analysis like data science and AI in order to solve this problem of search engines and, and websites. It's the page rank algorithm. Um, it, it, it was successful. And then other people kind of got on board and it hasn't stopped. There just doesn't seem to be anything that I'm seeing right now that indicates that this is coming to an end very soon. Uh, we have certain technologies that essentially have peaked and then essentially are in a decline, but new technologies are taking over uh, at every step of the way. So it just seems to be a continuous growth right now. And that kind of exponential uh, growth curve, which is actually a, a logistic sigmoid function in the technology curves, um, seems to be ramping up right now. So if I had to guess, I would say, yes, we're in it and we've been in it for a few years already. And the, the you know, like the industrial revolution took, you know, uh, decades in order from when it started until people would say, okay, it's, it's finally kind of stabilized. Um, and I think it, it, it could easily be decades before this thing stabilizes. But those people who have gotten on the ground early um, are definitely, or the people that get on the ground the earliest are definitely going to do the best, just like in the previous technology revolutions. The early adopters, uh, just turn out way more successful in the long run. All right. Is there any content on Pluralsight that you can recommend uh, um, for anyone that is interested in learning uh, about AI? 
Uh, yeah, so the, the next three courses I would recommend, if you want the very uh, high level picture, are uh, my artificial intelligence, the big picture course, uh, which is, is very different from uh, this presentation. Um, the data science, the big picture, and then the deep learning, the big picture. Those three courses, I think, give you the, the overall landscape of artificial intelligence so you can figure out which path you want to go down next. So watch those three courses. And then um, if you need more advice, like on where to go after that, uh, just shoot me an email and I'd be more than happy to give you direction. Oh, and another thing I should point out, um, I have another course coming out on Pluralsight here this month called the AI Developers Toolkit. Um, it's going to be a, a, a much more uh, kind of hands-on practical applications of artificial intelligence. So it's going to teach you um, how to apply artificial intelligence to working with tables of data, text, audio, images, video, and then how to combine these things to build uh, AI applications. And then, um, you know, in the big picture, uh, how, to, how to combine these technologies to build uh, cyber physical systems, which are robots like um, self-driving cars, uh, you know, vacuums that can, you know, vacuum or robotic vacuums and stuff like that. Uh, next question is from Tanya. Will most companies prefer formal education through universities or companies, or will learning through resources like Pluralsight be recognized? So I think in the past, there was kind of a stigma against online learning, but that seems to be disappearing. Um, I'm in, especially in the technology space, it seems like online education is more and more uh, recognized by more and more industries. There's always like the distinction between getting an online education with a certificate versus one without a certificate. So if you have the option to get a certificate with your online education, I would definitely recommend getting those certificates because anything you can do to essentially show uh, you've learned these skills is beneficial. But ultimately, um, you have to be able to demonstrate that not only you learned this stuff, that you can actually do this stuff. So that's why having a uh, like an open source project or a portfolio of projects, uh, or you know, if, if you're showing your current employer, um, you know how you've done these things, like having projects that you've done at work that demonstrate you understand these skills and can apply these skills, uh, that's even more valuable. But I, I say I would say there's definitely a change in the industry where we are placing less value on traditional education and more value on online education. And I, I don't see that changing anytime soon. In fact, the, I think the proof of this is that some of the most prestigious universities in the world have gone completely online with some of their programs. Like for example, um, I'm currently taking my master's degree from Johns Hopkins University, one of the top universities in the United States, completely online. That wouldn't have happened a, a decade ago or two decades ago. It just, it wasn't technically uh, easy to do. And most universities, um, thought it was not prestigious to do that. MIT, um, you can take AI programs uh, from MIT. Stanford is the, the um, most well-respected university in artificial intelligence in the world. And they have their uh, program, their certificate of uh, artificial intelligence completely online. What, um, what route can an aspiring AI developer take? Um, so let's see, I think the right answer for this is, uh, you know, if you, ha you have a Pluralsight subscription, I'm assuming, um, there aren't a whole lot of courses on doing practical AI on Pluralsight. Um, let's see, I need to be careful of how I word this. So the courses are coming on doing practical AI applications, but right now most of the courses are on data science and machine learning specifically. Um, whereas uh, like using uh, computer vision services, using like audio analysis services, using text analytic services, those courses are currently being created right now. So I would say for the time being, you probably want to be focusing on the foundations of uh, artificial intelligence, which is data science and machine learning. Get that education now, because within the next couple of years, uh, we're gonna see a flood of AI courses come out. Um, and in fact, my new AI developers toolkit is, is, will probably be one of the uh, the, the first ones in the practical AI space on Pluralsight. Okay, how can I start my career using augmented reality? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how can you start your career? Well, I, I would say it's, it's obviously you've got to have the education. So you need to be able to learn how to use these augmented reality tools and right now, AI is uh, very important in the augmented reality space because most of the tricks that we do to make augmented reality work uh, are dependent upon machine learning models and certain, um, you know, like uh, uh, 
computer vision tasks and stuff like that. Um, you know, like mapping your space and, and keeping everything in perspective. Um, so yeah, get the education first. You're almost certainly going to have to have some projects that show your ability to do augmented reality. So build something that does a something cool with augmented reality and open source that, or get that into um, a portfolio of some kind so you can show that to potential employers. But um, to, to, I think, really get big in that space, you're either going to need to have a startup company that essentially is focused on artificial intelligence that you can either you either you start it or you're working uh, for that company or one of the big players in the AI space that if you can convince them that you have the skills in order to provide real value for them uh, with the products that they're building, uh, get your foot in the door there and you know you can do pretty amazing things. Can we get an update on Slack uh, when these AI courses are released on Plural or on Plural Site, or for example, uh, your AI developers toolkit? Uh, yeah, I hadn't even thought of that, but um, I will make a note that as soon as the course is released, I will let uh, everyone know um, in the Serenzi Global Slack channel. And I'll be making the announcements in public too on my website and via social media. In fact, Geo will be um, coordinating the marketing efforts behind that. I think that's uh, all the questions we have at the moment. If, if uh, anyone wants to uh, chip in with another one, I think this is, this is the time. Well, and I think we're at 9.03 right now. So uh, we pretty much used up our time. So unless anyone has one final question to ask, I think we'll wrap things up here and, and then move on. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you found this information valuable. Um, like I said, please give me some feedback. Um, what did you like about this presentation? Uh, what things do you think I could do to improve it for future audiences? Uh, because I'm guessing this presentation will probably be a, uh, a, a regular thing I do once a year for uh, Serenzi Global. And I give this presentation to clients on a semi-regular basis. So, all right, have a great day.